Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Tom Siebel, CEO of C3AI and a veteran leader in Silicon Valley. Tom, great to see you. Thank you, Andy. Nice to be here. So tell us about C3AI. What specifically does it do? Uh, C3AI is an enterprise application software company, and we began 15 years ago, before AWS, before the Google Cloud, before Azure, and before the, before the uh, GPU, building a software stack that would enable companies, we believed that the future would be about elastic cloud computing, big data, internet of things, and predictive analytics. So in January of 2009, we began work building a software stack that is thousands of person years of software engineering and a couple of billion dollars worth of work uh, that provides all the services necessary and sufficient to design, develop, provision, operate massive scale enterprise AI applications. And then we use that stack to build 90 now uh, enterprise AI applications that address the value chains of utilities, energy, oil and gas, defense, intelligence, consumer packaged goods, financial services, what have you. So we have 90 uh, enterprise AI applications mm -hmm. in the market today. Right. So now it is, you know, fast forward a little bit, you know, a decade and a half. And, you know, after, say, November of 2022, all of a sudden, the world woke up and decided that enterprise AI was something important, and uh, that is now going through a little bit of a hype cycle. That being said, right. I don't think this is ephemeral. I think it's legit, and we are now find ourselves with 90 turnkey enterprise AI applications, which right. I think is something like 89 more than anybody else in the world. And the company you, you founded in 2009 didn't start off per se about AI, although you did end up getting the ticker AI, which was a great move. It evolved a little bit over time, did it not? It did. The stack that we built, it was the same. Mm -hmm. And we were applying these basically predictive analytics to the value chain of the power grid. So it was really focused on energy. Okay, right. and optimizing, allowing people to measure their carbon footprint, measure and, and monetize their, their uh, uh, energy footprint. And if we look at the grid, the power grid is not arguably, in fact, the largest and most complex machine ever built. And this is about the time that we started the company, the global utility companies were going through a upgrade of the infrastructure to make the entire grid uh, remotely machine addressable. They spent like two or three trillion dollars on that globally. Mm -hmm. And so this was the first value chain that we optimized using AI to allow um, grid operators to deliver safer, cleaner, more reliable uh, energy at lower environmental impact into the hands of um, more satisfied consumers. And so can you give an example, Tom, of how a customer would use your company's software? Sure, uh, Shell, for example. Shell's about a, almost a $400 billion business that uses C3 AI across its entire value chain, whether this is deep water, let's say predictive maintenance for offshore oil rigs, mm. uh, predictive analytics to, to identify uh, hydrocarbon loss accounting and pipelines going across Africa, uh, well placement analytics, production optimization in wells, um, uh, using AI to optimize uh, refinery operations and process optimization, integration of renewables. Um, uh, these are uh, theft, uh, energy theft. Right now uh, at Shell, Shell's probably is one of the largest AI application deployments on earth. Uh, and the economic benefit that they accrue from the use of our products is $2 billion a year in recurring economic benefit. Bank of America uses it for customer churn. Uh, Cargill uses it for supply chain and demand chain optimization associated with $100 billion worth of protein. Uh, and if we get that wrong, North Africa starves. Mm -hmm. um, we use, were used very frequently in defense and intelligence applications, uh, space, contested right. logistics, uh, Intel. These are, these are the types of applications. So this is Big iron, big stuff, big oil, big utilities, big steel, big aerospace, big enterprise computing problems. Got it. Now, the stock started off with a bang and then it's cooled off a little bit over the past couple of years. 
Why is that? What's going on in the marketplace there? Well, when we went out in the market, this was kind of before the AI boom. Uh, we went public, as I recall, it was December 2020. We priced the stock at 42, which we thought was a four, fair price. I think it opened that day at 101 mm -hmm. and immediately ran up like in the course of the next two days to like 190 or something. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. It didn't make any sense at all. Right. And uh, the, you know, sometimes markets behave in non-rational ways. And so I have no explanation for that. And you know, thank goodness that bubble did burst very quickly. And so the stock settled down to reality. Um, and then when we repriced, our, we, we changed our pricing model as a public company from a subscription-based model to a consumption-based model. That brought our growth rates down. Mathematical certainty was going to bring our growth rates mm -hmm. down. Then our, and our growth rates were, I think, north of 40, 50, 60 percent compound mm -hmm. annual growth rate a year. Well, it came down almost, well, it came down to, to negative, mm -hmm. okay, growth rate, and then zero. And now, and, and so we had to go through a period of, of that transition. And as we did, the stock came down with the growth rate. And now the stock seems to be rising as the growth rate has accelerated in the past few quarters from, I think, 0% to 4% to 7% to 16%. And it's, it's now been accelerating. What's the case for buying the stock going forward for investors? AI application software market, this is not ephemeral. This is a couple trillion dollar uh, opportunity. So this will be the largest market that we've seen in the history of enterprise application software. C3 AI has significant first market advantage, first mover advantage in the space. I mean, come on, I was talking about enterprise AI, you know, a decade before anybody, anybody else in the world. And so we have a significant first mover advantage. Uh, we're looking at in the, we're looking at a couple trillion dollar addressable uh, market opportunity by any analyst uh, projections. Uh, at the bottom of that, we have silicon. Okay, above silicon, we have infrastructure. Above that, we have learning models. And in the long run, the largest share of that stack is going to be enterprise applications, and that's where we play. So the game that we're playing like we did in a previous mm -hmm. life at Oracle and a previous life when I was CEO of Siebel Systems is to see if we can establish and maintain a clear market leadership position in enterprise AI. And uh, if we do that, this will be one of the important companies in information technology. That would be the bull market case. Fair enough. How do you see AI changing our lives, Tom? Maybe from an enterprise standpoint, business, and then from personal. Holy moly, Andy, it changes mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changes everything about the way we communicate, about the way we do our jobs, the way that journalists will do their jobs, the way that you would do research, you know, particularly with the advent of, of, of generative AI. I mean, this is, this is staggering. Uh, it changed the way that lawyers would do their jobs. Uh, we're working with two law firms now with generative AI that fundamentally changes, okay, the nature of work. It makes these people much more effective at what they do. It may, changes the way that we will do medicine with precision medicine, genome specific medics, mm -hmm. medical protocols, what have you, uh, distance medicine. It changes the way we design products, manufacture products. There's no aspect of our lives, okay, in entertainment, in, in manufacturing, okay, in, um, in uh, uh, knowledge workers mm -hmm. that, that will not be uh, influenced and accelerated and enhanced by the use of AI. Should we go fast or slow? You know, there's sort of two camps there. Well, there's just one speed, and this is at the speed of science, and this is going fast. I mean, this is not this is not going to be stopped. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is this is happening. Right. And do you think that, say, a company like Microsoft and OpenAI together, do they hold too much sway over the marketplace, or is there enough diffused um, progress going on with AI generated. Well, first, AI. let me comment. Mm -hmm. I think the Microsoft's you know, use of AI and what they're doing with Copilot is nothing short of um, genius. I mean, these guys are very talented people, and I think the way that they've enhanced their products with Edge, with Word, with with Office, in terms of incorporating AI into those products. So, you know, there was this thought not too many years ago that AI meant that we had to completely retrain our workforce and every cab driver in New York City needed to become a, uh, a data scientist. Well, this is a bunch of bunk, okay? And the way that AI will be incorporated is the way that Microsoft is incorporating AI. You don't even know it's there, okay? And it's making suggestions for you. It's correcting your spelling. It's correcting your references. 
you know, it's generating prose for you. It, it, Copilot is writing code, for, assisting you writing code if you're a programmer. So you didn't, you're using the tools that you used before and you don't even know the AI is there helping you. And right. so you don't need to know anything about data science to use these tools. And do OpenAI and Microsoft have too much influence? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fairness, is OpenAI uh, done some significant things? They have. But is OpenAI going to win this thing? There's no reason to believe that. Holy moly, this is first half of the first inning. First person's on its way to bat. This is a big market. And there's some belief that one of Microsoft or Google or Facebook or Amazon is going to win this AI battle. I don't know why we should believe that. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in previous generations of information technology, and you've seen a few just like I have, the obvious winner never wins. And so I suspect the real winner in these language models comes out of Paris or the Bronx or some company we haven't even heard of yet. And I mean, remember last Thanksgiving? I mean, goodness gracious, OpenAI could be out of business this Thursday. And I mean, it could, it could disappear and it really wouldn't make much difference to the world. You do have a lot of experience in these markets. You mentioned your time at Oracle and Siebel Systems, the big company that you founded that was later bought by Oracle. You came, you went, came back. What are you most proud of in terms of your work at Oracle and at Siebel Systems? I think that we, there's no question at Oracle and there's no question at Siebel is that we assembled really bright teams to help governments, uh, to help uh, uh, government agencies, okay, and to help corporations use information technology to provide higher quality uh, services and products to more satisfied customers. And I'm, I'm confident we succeeded at that at Oracle. I'm confident we succeeded at that at Siebel. And I know we're succeeding with that at C3. And that's what I'm most proud of. I want to ask you a little bit more about Silicon Valley, Tom, because you've spent so much time there. For instance, do you still follow what Oracle does? Are you still in touch with Larry Ellison? I have no idea what Oracle does. I'm actually not sure what business they're in today. And I haven't spoken with Larry in a while. Mm -hmm. I think Larry is a, you know, Larry is clearly a gifted guy and a giant in the information technology industry. I know Oracle is a very big company. I'm not quite sure what they do. You moved on. All right, so what's your take on Silicon Valley right now and the mood in terms of its relationship with, say, Wall Street and the rest of the economy? Well, you know, Silicon Valley is pretty busy again. And it's all now it's we have this big, you know, every company has become an AI company. Every company that has a technology stack, many of these technology stacks go back to 1995, 2000, 2005, and they all put AI on the cover of their box. They got a new sticker and they became AI. So that seems to be the big hype. We're seeing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these companies getting, getting, um, financed at staggering market valuations by the Andreas and Horowitz and Sequoias of the world. And, you know, just like the dot com, you know, we will see hundreds to thousands of these kids get uh, financed. And, you know, when the music stops, we'll see thousands of these companies go out of business. So we're now we're in kind of one of these bubble cycles. So it's kind of fun to watch. But are analysts looking for these companies to have profitability or not? There's sort of always a, a come and go there, isn't there? I think in the you know, right now, if we if we look at the public company market, okay, so these, uh, you know, I'm not sure these sell side analysts are quite as uh, do the research that they used to do. Now they kind of they spend their whole world inside their Excel spreadsheet model. They don't visit customers, they don't visit companies, they don't visit competitors, they don't really, you know, get a feel for what's going on. And, you know, there's a mood uh, after, I would say after uh, 2021, 2022, where we've swung from, gee, you can't spend money fast enough. Uh, and the only thing important is to gain market share and don't worry about profitability to today, you know, they're, they're, they're in a mood where you know, every company has to be, you know, profitable this quarter, next quarter, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of silly that these people swing so hard with these trends that are, you know, that, that are ephemeral, that will go away. I mean, when we look at the software business, the name of the game is market share. And when we look at these rapidly growing markets like the relational database market, like the enterprise application software market, like the CRM market, um, when we uh, see these markets expand, many, many companies will get financed and 
scores of them will go public. And one of those companies will become the market leader in this space, and they usually get about 50% share. And then when the market turns, somebody will invest. Mm -hmm. And it takes, and, and, and investing means you're not making a profit. And those people that invest become the market leaders. And when the market turns, they tend to be the companies that endure and create great shareholder value. Let's take a look at Amazon. I mean, Amazon took 29 years to sustain a profit, 29 years. Okay, how'd that work out for investors when, you know, when Jeff Bezos took all that heat over the years of not running a profitable business 20, for 29 years? Okay. Mm -hmm. How'd that work out for investors? Today's got what, $2 trillion market cap, rough, rough numbers. Right. Let's talk about Mark Benioff. I mean, Mark has done a fine job. I believe he's built, built you know, the world's leading enterprise application software company. It took them 25 years to become a sustain. They didn't become sustainably profit profitable until 2023, 25 years. And so he just ignored the analyst and he did what was right. And how much value has he created for his shareholders? I think about, you know, $250 billion for his shareholders. So he's done, done a fine job. And so at C3, I mean, we're focused at market leadership and we are invest. I could, I could make this company profitable this week, okay? I mean, it's not that hard to make a company profitable. Come on, you just figure out how much revenue you'll get upcoming and you spend less than that, okay? And we're, we're, we're a structurally profitable company. And by that, I mean our, you know, our, our, our gross margins are substantially greater than our cost of sales. So we're, we're a structurally profitable company. And I could throw this into profitability in a second. Would that be in the best interest of shareholders? No way, no how. I, you know, right. I raised a billion dollars in, in the public market in when? December of 2020, I think. And we raised that money to invest in the market, invest in brand, invest in brand equity, invest in technology leadership. Today, I think we have three quarters of a billion dollars, rough numbers. Last time I did a public announcement, I think we had roughly uh, three quarters of a billion dollars of cash in the bank. And so we're, we're very healthy and I'm investing in market share. And uh, will this be a cash positive company? Absolutely. Will it be a profitable company? Absolutely. Is it the right thing to do it this quarter? Absolutely not. Let me ask you some questions about you. First of all, you seem so passionate about this, Tom, but you don't have to be doing this. Why are you still at this game? Andy, this is my idea of a good time. In other words, we're, I, you know, I love to build you know, leading companies. I love to attract, to, to, I go to work every day with a thousand professionals. As you know, we're a little bit unusual. We're, you know, we have a, you know, we all work together in the office. Um, and these are people with, you know, exceptionally well-trained. I think, you know, 65% of our people have advanced degrees, 10% have PhDs, and we're working shoulder to shoulder on just enormously difficult problems. We're inventing new things, we're inventing new markets, and we're playing a meaningful role in inventing the enterprise AI market, like we played a meaningful role in, in inventing the CRM market. In all fairness, I might have invented that. Mm -hmm. And with Larry at Oracle, we did invent the relational database market. So this is fun stuff. And and so this is this for better, this is my idea of a good time, and this is why I do it. And so we're we're having fun, we're building great product for making customers successful. I'm working with talented people, and I believe we're building one of the world's great companies. On the personal side of things, you are a very philanthropic person. So I wanna ask you what drives you there, what the focus of your philanthropy is. And then also I wanna ask you about what happened to you in Africa when you got attacked by an elephant. Well, that was a bad day. Uh, I, like everybody, like you and like all of our friends, you know, to the extent that we can, we want to give back to the community. And I've been very fortunate in my career, and so I've had the opportunity to give back to the community. And uh, we invest a lot in education, you know, a lot of scholarships, a lot of scholarships for underprivileged people, um, uh, a lot in, in, in research, a lot in uh, public health, uh, uh, we do a lot, of, a lot of work in homelessness, um, and I've done some I'm very interested. You know, kind of recently, uh, I've been doing some work with the University of Illinois, uh, focusing on what I see as the future of data science. Okay, and making sure that there's been a trend recently mm -hmm. uh, that we've seen at Berkeley and MIT and others 
to split off data science from engineering into separate disciplines, I believe that's a mistake. And so we're, we're, we're doing some work with the University of Illinois and some other universities to help keep these things closely intertwined. But University of Illinois, where you went, your alma mater with Mark Andreessen, Mark different Andreessen times. Mark was, right. was a little bit after me, <clears throat> right, but yes, right. I have three degrees from the University of Illinois. Yeah. Uh, I've been, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a, a product of the public school system, a land grant institution in the state where I grew up. Yeah. And I was fortunate to get a, uh, uh, a number of degrees there, one in history, one in business and history of science actually, and uh, one in uh, a graduate degree in computer science in relational database theory. Um, and ever since I've left there, I've been very active at the University of Illinois in helping them uh, realize their mission as a public land grant uh, uh, state university that I think is just a superlative organization. I'm proud to be associated with it. And, and finally, can you tell us about what happened that day in Africa? August 1st, 2009. Uh, my wife and daughters had been, you know, had been encouraged me for me for some years to take them on a safari to Africa. So in August of 2009, we went on a safari to Africa, and we were in Tanzania, and uh, in late July. And uh, after about three days, my wife and daughters were kind of bored of riding around in a Land Rover the way that you will, looking at oceans of wildebeest and 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 Cape buffalo and what have you. And so they were taking a break, and one of the one of the activities that they featured at this um, at this camp, which was you know pretty big concession, I think it was about a half million acres in the Serengeti in Tanzania, was walking safaris. So I asked our guide uh, Lee if we could go on a walking safari in the morning, and he said, "Absolutely, Mr. Siebel, meet me for coffee at six thirty. And so we, but this is a you know this is kind of a Four Seasons level campsite, and uh, I meet him for coffee, and he explains to me that you know Mr. Siebel is very care. You know he's going to be carrying a double barrel 470 rifle. Um, the 470 is a charge about the size of a roll of dimes, and I was armed with an Icon camera, and we were going to go for a walk. And he said, Mr. Siebel, it's very important if we get charged by an animal, okay, that you don't run because if you get if you run, we're going to get hurt. So long story short, we go out about daybreak. And we skirt around a herd of Cape buffalo, which is pretty pretty interesting thing to skirt around. And uh, about five minutes later, we come upon a herd of fifteen elephant, about two hundred meters away, and they were half adults and half juveniles. And there was a stand of trees there. The Serengeti is just a kind of a big desert. There's not much relief. There's no hills. There's not many trees, but there were some trees, and they were ripping branches off of these trees the way that they will. And so we stood there, it's a dark day daybreak, and we watched. And then the wind must have shifted or something, because all of a sudden this one matriarch elephant goes back on her haunches, her ears go back, her trunks goes up, and she bellows, and it's just deafening how loud she bellows. And then she got a, you know, she got us in her crosshairs, and she starts this well, this elephant, this is five tons of elephant coming at us at 30 miles an hour. Well, at 30 miles an hour, you cover 200 meters pretty quickly. And so it's the elephant, the guide, me. 100 meters, this thing is still booking, coming at us. 70 meters, 60 yards, meters, 50 meters, guide doesn't shoot. 40 meters, 30 meters, 20 meters, guide doesn't shoot. This is starting to get a little concerning. At 10 meters, the guide shoots and misses. The elephant comes up, wraps his truck, her track around the guy, and just tosses him. So he flies about 10 meters away, and she comes up, stops 18 inches from my face. It's very surreal, because you really don't have a place to put an elephant. And there's an elephant, I mean, to this moment, I can, I can smell it, I can see the hair follicle, the eyeball, the tusk, everything. It went 18 inches away. Was, and meanwhile, Tom hasn't run, you know, and, and you know, we're still holding our ground. So, okay, what do you want to, you know, how do you want to handle this? What do you want to do now? And then she proceeds to knock me to the ground, kind of roll me, punch me, gore me. I took a tusk through my left leg. Uh, she stepped on my right leg. My right foot came off. I mean, I'm taking hits, Andy, like you can't believe. And I'm getting rolled. It's very surreal. It just hurt so bad. And I remember, you know, I, to this day, I have a thought. You know, I said, you know, please, God, make this stop. And I really didn't care how it stopped. I mean, it, I couldn't do it anymore. Look up, elephant's gone. Long story short, mm -hmm. 
They surrounded me with, you know, they called the lodge, surrounded me with trucks. I lay there bleeding with my foot off, my leg flayed open for three and a half hours, uh, airlifted in the back of a Cessna tail dragger to Nairobi, uh, airlifted from Nairobi, had surgery in Nairobi, airlifted from Nairobi to San Jose, California, 20 hour flight. Uh, they had 10 hours of morphine. And so the last 10 hours were pretty long. And I spent the next five years um, and had 19 reconstructive surgeries. I walked five years later. There were two surgeons that wanted to amputate my right leg. And I explained to them that we really didn't have anything further to talk about. And this meeting interview was over. And uh, so I went on down the road and the bottom line, this is my leg. And I did walk five years later. And since then I've set, you know, I've done a lot of extreme sports, kiting, you know, I do a lot of mm. kiting, extreme sailing. I've won world's record sailing and, uh, and uh, I'm still here in the alphanism. Tom Siebel, he is a fighter, CEO of C3 AI. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Andy. This is Zach Barons. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time.